Thanks so much for that introduction. My name's Katie, and this is my business partner, Victoria Cole. Hi, guys. Awesome. <laughs> so we are coming here today from North Carolina. A little bit of background. Uh, he just introduced our professional backgrounds, but in addition to graphic design, I'm also an interactive theater for social change actor. So what that means is I go across the country performing at colleges and universities on things like sexual harassment, sexual assault, racism, and pretty much everything else under the ism umbrella. So what that means is you guys are getting a warm up this morning. <laughs> Bet you weren't expecting that. So everybody stand up. And if you're not standing next to each other, just move forward for this first bit. It'll take like two minutes. I know everyone's so excited. It's 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. <laughs> so we're playing a game called Gotcha. What you're going to do is you're going to take your right hand and make a thumb and put your thumb upside down and scoot next to a person if you're not by a partner or neighbor. You're going to make a palm with your left <laughs> hand and you're going to stick your thumb into your neighbor's palm. So this game is called Gotcha. I'm going to count to three and on three you are going to try to grab your partner's thumb and make sure your thumb doesn't get got. All right. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, I, yeah, I didn't even follow my own rules there. Sorry. <laughs> All right, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. OK. One, two, three. Oh, I, once again, didn't follow my own rules. I'm killing it this round. I All right, we're going to switch it up. We're going to switch it up. Make your left thumb a thumb and flip it upside down. And make your right hand a palm. And we're going to go the other way. This time, I'm going to be a little bit of a sporadic counter. So just get on your toes. One, two, two. Ooh. <laughs> oh no, I know everyone else is feeling that right now. Okay, three. Oh. All right, thank you so much for <laughs> warm up the brains this morning. Warming up the brains, right? Getting, getting moving, getting a little bit more engaged. It is 9 a.m., so sorry to put you through that. So um, as, as our introducer was talking about, Carborough Creative's mission is to empower women and minority-owned businesses to succeed with impactful design. Carborough Creative grew out of Victorianized frustration with our options in the traditional workforce. And we're two of many women who have left their traditional workforce in previous years. So since 1997, women-owned businesses have grown by 114%. Wow. That number is even larger for women who, of color who own businesses. So businesses owned by women of color have grown by 467%. And this Jeez. is, yeah, <laughs> this is compared to the national growth rate of 44%. On the surface, that seems incredible. More and more women are starting their own businesses. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you find that a lot of these women are necessity entrepreneurs. So a necessity entrepreneur is somebody who's starting their own business because they don't have any other options. So they're either unemployed or underemployed or face certain challenges in their workplace that make working a typical job impossible. So as women, I'm sure we've all faced our challenges in the workplace. And there's some that are pretty well known and we'll kind of dive deep into a lot of them. Um, so why are women leaving the traditional workforce? There's higher unemployment among women. There's family responsibilities that make working a traditional nine to five really, really challenging, especially when PTO is limited. There's a lack of flexibility when you have a family, when you need those extra hours, or if you have health concerns or other mitigating circumstances that make it really challenging. And then when you do find a job, women make 76% of their male counterparts. So it's incredibly frustrating knowing that the work you're doing isn't being valued as those around you. There's the boys club. Most industries are still typically dominated by men. And when you have men dominated industries and there's one or two female and on a team or even a department, that can breed a culture of sexual harassment and discrimination. And that's why I left the workforce myself. Uh, being in two previous jobs with sexual harassment, I grew incredibly frustrated and started looking for other options. There's a lack of visibility among female leadership and female, um, female bosses, female managers. So it's hard to envision yourself growing within a company or seeing your growth potential where you don't have an example to look up to. So we'll dive a little bit into that. It's what I call the leadership conundrum. On average, women are 18% less likely than men to be promoted into manager positions. And this is from entry level positions. So starting from the ground up, 
you don't have the same possibilities and growth potential as your male counterpart. And it gets worse as you continue growing within a company. Only one in five C-level executives are women. But like, I think the population is half women, right? Right. Right. Yeah, so that seems like a really skewed statistic. It is. Yeah. And when you're in a job and when you're seeing these in your leadership position, when your bosses are, are, are men and not women, it, you can grow discouraged. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this comes down to a, the idea of a personality bias, where women who are assertive and decisive are seen as aggressive and bossy, and women who don't assert themselves are seen as weak or lacking leadership skills. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation. And I know we're talking a lot about negative stuff. I promise we'll get to more positive stuff right now. But we want to just kind of discuss the foundation of why women are leaving. And women who are in roles aren't applying for promotions or aren't applying for jobs that they don't feel qualified for. Women don't apply for a job unless they feel they meet 100% of the requirements. Men apply when they meet 60%. But I thought when you apply for a job, you have to have all of the requirements. Right. I've always thought that. <laughs> so did I. Yeah. So for all of my jobs, I've only applied when I met 100% of the requirements. And I've only applied for promotions when I felt I met 100% of the requirements. And women who even go so far as to apply for a promotion or raise are 30% more likely to be seen as intimidating, aggressive, and bossy as compared to men. And I can speak wow. to that. Right. <laughs> I can speak to that personally. Um, in my first job as an office manager, I was working for a startup that was developing a product that helped women, which sounded really, really cool. Going into an industry, going into a job where I felt like I was doing something. Um, but I quickly learned that they weren't insulated from the same problems we're talking about. Within the first few months, I started working directly under the VP of product development, working with design and ideation and starting to really build and brand this product. So when she had to leave abruptly, I took over all of her responsibilities and projects. So for a few months, I was doing both of my jobs simultaneously. I was doing all of my office management jobs and I was doing all of her projects as a product, the VP of product development. And I finally decided to ask for a raise. I sat down with our CEO and I wasn't asking to be paid as much as the VP of product development. I wasn't asking to be making twice as much as I'm making. But since I was an office manager and I was doing payroll, I did know I was making less than anybody else in the company. So I didn't think I was going out of left field to ask to be paid appropriately. So I sat down with them, I laid out what, my val what value I brought to the company, the responsibilities, the jobs I was doing, and his response, well, we didn't hire you for that position. We wouldn't have hired you for that position. You didn't have the requirements. Why should we pay you for something that we would not have hired you for? But you were already doing the job, right? Yes, for months. I had been doing the job for right. months. So I had that reaction too. I was in that meeting and I, was, I didn't say anything. I was like, all right. So I left that meeting feeling undervalued and really questioning my role in the company and whether or not I would continue to grow in that company. If, if I was doing a job and I wasn't being recognized, how else was I going to be promoted within the company? So I sent an email pretty much clarifying everything we talked in that conversation. And I did get a raise that next week but it shouldn't have to take me essentially threatening to quit the job for our bosses to recognize our worth. So another factor in women-owned businesses, uh, or a lot of women leaving to start their own businesses, um, has to do with family. Um, women with a partner and children are 5.5 times more likely to do um, all of the housework than their male counterparts, um, which is an issue in itself. However, women tend to take on more family responsibilities. Um, and this can be make a traditional work day a little bit more incompatible, or uh, which is incompatible, and it you know there becomes a need for flexibility. Um, I am one of the women who left a job because of the inflexibility of a traditional work day. Um, after having my son, um, I realized that it was really difficult, um, especially because I found out my son has special needs, um, finding adequate child care, finding affordable child care in order to uh, provide flexibility so that I could keep working day to day. Um, and at the same time, uh, I did leave my full-time job after I returned from maternity leave. But at least you got maternity leave, right? Yeah, I mean, it's fairly required that you get 
you know, a couple months after you have a child for maternity leave. Right, because women who have children probably need some paid time off to, you know, recuperate. Yeah, except for it's never paid. <laughs> really? Um, I mean, a lot of women do work for corporations or companies that provide paid time off, which is fantastic. However, a large majority of the United States does not have paid time off for maternity leave, which makes it very difficult in order to return to um, the job because you're not paid for several months. Um, and when my experience, and depending on the state laws where you live, um, uh, there are different requirements for companies to provide. But the when I returned from my job or from my <laughs> maternity leave, I found that when I got back, I had actually been demoted. Um, Wait, so you were demoted? Why? Um, because my boss said that I probably needed a lesser responsibility from all the things that I had going on. Wait, great. Wait, so because you had a baby, you couldn't do the job that you had been doing before? Right. Yeah. All right. That's what it seems like. Like, did he, what was his reasoning? Like, did you lose your brain when you had a baby? Um, uh, apparently that's what he thought, but I right. think it's still in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify too, North Carolina is a right to work state. So we don't have a lot of the same um, workers, like uh, workers regulations. Rights or regulations rights. as some of the other states, maybe like California. I think that's what it's on yeah. Yeah. So in North Carolina, it is illegal in, uh, but only in very specific ways. So um, with Victoria, she was put in a lesser position and not immediately, her pay wasn't immediately lowered, but a month after she was in this lesser position, they came to her and said, well, you know, corporate doesn't think this position is worth that amount of money anymore. So there are definitely ways that to get around um, it. corporate, uh, you know, companies may skirt these laws in order to cause these issues to happen. Um, I was I was working in the automotive industry, which is a incredibly male dominated field. I think there were two women in my entire department of probably 60 people. So um, the access to the um, yeah, basically. So we, you know, and having women to stand up for you, to, and to have women to, to stand up for them, or women who've been through the same thing was hard, difficult to find. And we um, want to clarify: we recognize that not all women who are starting their businesses are doing it out of necessity. There are so many awesome creative entrepreneurs and innovators and fantastic women who have an idea and are rolling with it. Um, we're just speaking from our experience and a lot of the women that we're working with, their experience that's, that they have shared with us. So not all women are starting <laughs> businesses because they have to, but that's a lot of what we're touching on today. So how we empower women with design. When we did design to start our own businesses, mm -hmm. we laid that in the foundation of who we were. It's in our mission to empower women-owned businesses. We thought as designers, it was our responsibility to do something with design that we felt passionate about and that we felt would help other women in positions similar to our own. So the first way we do that is we work with women-owned businesses. And this seemed like a no-brainer. Women-owned businesses are growing twice as fast as any other business. The market is there, the need is there, and advertisers, designers, and other marketing professionals aren't listening to that need. You know, 91% of women don't feel like advertisers understand them at all. And seven out of 10 will go so far as to say as they feel completely alienated by marketing design. We are letting these women down. We are letting down the consumers who are purchasing items or visiting websites, and we're letting down the women business owners who are buying the websites and buying the websites to speak to their target audiences. So one of the things we hear time and time again from our clients who have tried to go to designers in the past, have tried to have had websites designed, is that they weren't even given the time of day. They've gone to agencies where the minimum budget was $25,000. As a small business, that's impossible. Or they did find a designer and they didn't listen to their needs. They didn't feel heard. The designers were pushing their own agendas and telling clients what they needed for their business without even understanding what their business was. Or they found a designer and didn't feel like they could trust them. They didn't feel like the designer knew enough about web design, marketing, or any of the, the skills to really help grow their business in a way that was impactful. Um, so one of the things that we do uh, to empower women through design is that we build effective websites with women in mind. Um, we choose to provide designs that will elevate and uh, promote women-owned businesses, women's uh, issues, and products that are designed for women. Uh, we believe it's our responsibility to invest our time into these projects. Uh, effective web, web design uh, captures the mission, the brand, and the values of the company. Um, you want your website to obviously motivate your customers to engage with your company, and you want it to promote a professional uh, presence so that your customers uh, or your clients um, 
know that you're a business that they can trust. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure everyone else has been in the position where you don't go to a business because their website, frankly, sucked. That you went to the website and you're like, how can I trust a business in my experience with that business if I don't like my experience with their website? Things were clunky. You didn't even have any idea what they were selling, where they were located, who they were. Their brand was non-existent. If they had a brand, it wasn't consistent across all of the pages. There were so many problems. And a lot of those problems come from people who are on, people like the people we work with who are either building their websites themselves because they couldn't find a designer that they could trust to work with. They're going to sites like Wix and Squarespace that have templates that are incredibly generic. And if they're not a designer, they can't even work within those templates effectively. So we're having a lot of these issues come up or with designers who aren't listening to them and capturing their brand. Um, one of the biggest things that we do to really uh, empower women is to, we actually listen to them. Um, we reflect what they want and they need in their design. Um, and we take active listening skills in order to really capture what the client is desiring in what they want to promote from themselves. You know, it feels like a no-brainer, like sitting down with a client and hearing them, asking the right questions, being authentic. And I think that's a huge part of it. And we'll go through a couple of ways that we try to do this. But just being, being there, being present is so important, especially in the beginning process and throughout the entire process, having clear communication and listening to the needs of your clients. So there's a couple of things that we do in order to achieve this. Um, we send design questionnaires before we have a meeting. We try to get our clients to really focus in on what they actually want, what they really want to display to the world. Um, it also helps nail down, you know, what their, you know, style and design choices and, uh, you know. Uh, Having their yeah. needs on paper as and well also, yeah, before your first meeting. And it helps so when your first meeting, when you're actually sitting down with your clients, it's more focused on deepening and clarifying, clarifying instead of defining. So it saves you a ton of time. Also, logistically and contractually, having something in writing to refer back to as your scope of services helps throughout the process as well for having that clarity and transparency, which is exceptionally Super necessary <laughs> for having a good relationship with your client. Uh, next thing we do is we take copious notes. Um, I always have an iPad or a computer and type furiously throughout. Katie always has a piece of paper and a pencil. Multiple mediums. Multiple mediums. Because you never saying. know when the iPad decides to die. Um, so we, uh, Katie takes a million notes. We also organize those notes in a way that we can refer back to them afterwards. We like to be able to refer back so we don't have to keep asking the women the same questions over and over and over again. Um, Nothing screams we're not listening, like we're asking you the same question, question five times. Yeah. And also after the meetings, by organizing the notes, I know it sounds super annoying. And like at first, I was super hesitant about doing it because you already wrote the notes. Why should you go back and rewrite them and clarify them? But it makes it saves you time in the long run when you're able to quickly refer back to what you've talked about and pull from that for your design. And when you're taking notes and when you're asking those questions, ask the right questions. Ask questions that are thoughtful and detailed and ask questions that reflect what your client has already told you in their design questionnaire or when you're actively listening. And asking the right questions takes time to figure out what those questions are. Uh, what we like to do is when we're done working with a client, really reflect on our experiences and think of those moments where halfway through the design we're like, Oh shit, like I wish I would have asked that question. Now I have to go back and redo something because I made an assumption and I didn't have all the information. Right. Another part is that you really want to hone in on what your client really wants. By doing this, um, we use visual representations of styles, designs, um, concepts, uh, font choices, things like that. Um, in order to really nail down like what they actually want visually, what we found is that people have different versions of what words mean. So what, what I, something means to me may not mean the same thing to you. Um, take feminine, for example. Um, to some people, feminine is pink flowers and cursive writing. Um, to others, it's obviously something completely different. Um, so we really want to make sure that we're not making assumptions. <laughs> which is a big part. So don't make assumptions just because, um, you know, we don't really want to put a woman in the box. We don't want to put any client in a box. We don't want to assume based on gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, or industry even that they have anything. Um, we don't want to make any sort of assumptions. So what we do is, um, 
we, we follow what we're doing right now. We're asking the right questions, we're honing in. Right. And we face this with uh, clients in the same industry is where we've really found this to be important. So a lot of clients in one industry will find a designer that specializes in that industry. For example, accountants. So we're currently working with, accountant, with an accountant. And before meeting with us, she said she went to another designer who showed her a few different templates and a few different websites that essentially all looked the same and didn't actually capture who that accountant was or what their brand was. It was just accountant was the brand, which is not a brand. That is not saying who you are. You don't know what you're getting other than, okay, they know how to do things with numbers, but that doesn't say anything about your relationship or the experience you'll have with that business. Right. One of our big uh, two clients, we did two yoga organizations uh, site builds at the same time. Um, they were both yoga organizations. They were both owned by women. And what the final product ended up being a two completely different things because the mission of the companies were completely different. The target audience was completely different. The style and the preference of the owners of those companies were completely different. So making assumptions creates, uh, you know, issues that we don't want to happen. You know, if a client comes to you and wants a feminine website and, you know, pink flowery uh, or with cursive writing or something like that is what they want, just make sure that you actually get to that conclusion together and that it's not an assumption made um, without deciding together. And briefly touched on, um, don't make assumptions about what people mean when they say things like modern or vintage or any other design jargon, because modern to me can be completely different than modern to my client. So having, even within the website questionnaire, we like to have images of this is what a modern website looks like. This is what a vintage website looks like. This is what a tech website looks like. Having examples so they can say, I like that, I don't like that. It makes it so much easier for all of us in the long run. We use sliding scale billing. We so, take slides for payment? <laughs> yeah, we take slides for payment. Water slides, guitar slides, home slides, office slides, pretty much any slides that you can think of. Oh, that's awesome. I would love a slide for the We office. don't yet, but if anybody manufactures slides, please let us know because we're totally interested. But we do charge clients larger or smaller amounts based on the size of their company and based on the budgets that they have. We found that when working with our larger clients, we're able to charge a higher hourly fee or hour package fee so then we can work with smaller clients and take lower fees. And it makes sense to work like that. We don't think that design should just be accessible to people with money, especially women who are starting their own businesses that might not have the resources that might be a necessity entrepreneur, where this is their only option. I don't want to box them out of having the potential to grow because they can't afford us at that moment. With a lot of these clients, we found when we charge them a lower rate at first, and it helps get their website out there and it helps their website grow and their business grows, they have more design needs and they end up coming back to us and hiring us. And as their business grows, our business grows. So we're able to go back and renegotiate our fees and talk about that and be completely transparent with our clients when we start out so they know how, how our charging works and how our pricing works. And these are the same clients that are more likely to refer you to other people. So we like to think of working with people as building a relationship and not just a one-off design. Not just, we're not just building this website and not talking to you again. We want to be there to support you. We want to be there when you need business cards. We want to be there when you need website tweets or website updates. We want to be there with you through your entire journey as a business. And it becomes more fun for us too. It's more fun to work with people that you have a relationship with and way less stressful because it creates constant streams of income and you're not constantly trying to find new businesses to work with. So one of the things that we do to do that is we try to build a network within our community. So we're from North Carolina um, and our area is small but big. Um, so one of the things that we do is we try to make a community every day. We patron or we become patrons at women-owned businesses. We use their services. We eat at their restaurants. We talk to the owners, the workers. You get to know people in your community just by talking to people every day. I hate networking events. Like I absolutely despise sitting in a room and making small talk because it feels like cheap speed dating. So I try to get creative with what I consider networking, <laughs> which might be different for California. For me, it's going to the same yoga class every week and talking to the people next to me and telling people what I do and being proud of what you do, which can be really hard sometimes. You don't want to feel like you're selling or pushing people um, in a direction, but just being excited about your work. And even if that doesn't necessarily meet, lead to work in that instance, it can lead to something months down the line. 
Like, I remember the first time someone um, I was at I was at I was out with a few friends and one of the people there were like, "Oh, Carboro Creative, we've heard of you." And this was early on in our business, so I think my reaction was probably like, "Yeah, really? really? You sure? Like Carboro Creative? Like, like the yeah. right name there? <laughs> yeah, you're the one that does the women-owned business stuff." We're like, "Oh yeah, that's cool." She's like, yeah, you know, I was talking with a friend of a friend who had used your services and was super excited about it and the things that you were doing. So just having conversations with people in your community and keeping up those conversations can lead to a lot of work. Yeah, and asking for referrals with the, your clients that you already have. If a client loves your work, don't feel weird about asking them to tell people. Ask them to introduce people to, ask them to introduce you to others in their communities. Ask them to share reviews on your website and that you can share on your website, on your Facebook, on Google. Utilize the resources you have. Utilize social media. This isn't anything new, but it's something that can be really hard to do, especially when you're the one running a business or you're the one freelancing. So I forgot to ask at the beginning, but how many people here are designers? Awesome. Awesome, yeah. Nice, awesome. So how, yeah, how many people own a design company? Nice. And how many people are freelancers? Okay, awesome. And how many people work within an organization in their design team? Okay, cool. So we have a little bit of everything, which is super fun. So we try, we try to sprinkle things that can be true across the board. So even if you're working in a company right now and considering design or considering freelance design in the future, considering starting your own business, start laying the foundation. Start talking to your community, talking about wanting to do freelance. That's something that I did when I was still working in a full-time job. Um, we've mentioned yoga companies. I'm also a yoga teacher, and I've done yoga teacher training, so I have a large yoga community. When I was working in my full-time job, I started talking about doing freelance and started picking up small freelance jobs on the side. So when we started our business, we had two websites that we were hired for within our first month. So really start being proactive if you're at that point in your career or thinking about that, being proactive and setting the foundation for when that time comes, you can have things lined up. We use design as a tool for social change. So this is my favorite part of our job, and this is a huge part that, of a reason why I've taken the jobs that I've taken in the past, is using my skills as a, school, a tool for social change. So in addition to working with women-owned businesses, we work with nonprofits and organizations that promote, elevate, and empower women. One of the clients that we're working with right now is Duke University's Duke Women's Center. Has anybody here heard about Duke University? <laughs> <laughs> probably heard about some problems on Duke University's campus as well. <laughs> right, so we were, met uh, the director of Duke University Women's Center through one of our clients. So that was one of the networking um, that we had, she had talked to their center about us and they called <laughs> us in and they sat us down and they were like, we want to do a campaign to, to prevent sexual assault, and we need your help. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that is a heavy, that's a heavy project, and that has so many high needs that are go beyond just making a website. Um, that was a perfect situation where listening and working with our client has led to um, more impactful content and more, more diving deep. So Duke University Women's Center, works to elevate and promote the voices of women on campus and also end patriarchal oppression. They have um, counseling services that work with survivors of sexual assault and outreach in their community to work on these issues. So the point of this campaign would be a series of posters that um, brought light to some of the situations that students put themselves in, some of these very targeted specific areas where sexual assault is more prevalent than other, um, than other areas. And they basically sat us down and were like, we need to call out these places without getting fired. <laughs> so, I, and that's the type of climate that we're in. It's how can we be creative and um, how can we use our skills to help get their message out there in a respectful way, in a way that actually works. So being able to be part of a project like that is also super empowering for us because it feels like we are a part of this larger conversation and this larger mission that we wouldn't have been able to do by just taking um, other projects that were outside of this realm and really positioning ourselves in a way where they were seeking out our services for these specific projects. Um, another great organization that we work with is a United Church of Chapel Hill in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And it is a church that has been for 25 years um, dedicated to gender equality, 
um, social justice and the support of LGBTQ plus communities. It's um, the church that, like, if I had gone to if I had gone to this church as a kid, I probably would have kept going to it. Their um, foundation is all about lifting up voices of underrepresented, confronting white supremacy, using their resources, using their community to bring light to issues within North Carolina and within the United States. And so they are so. Um, they're great people to work with and they're what they're doing is great. So being able to work with them, mm -hmm. um, we started on a very small project where the budget for that particular project wasn't incredibly large. But we had known them as like the cool church of Chapel Hill, if there's such thing as like a cool church. And it was just like a fun project that we wanted to take on. And um, since we took that on, we have done multiple campaigns, a full rebranding, um, social justice work with them mm -hmm. and continue to work with them in a large capacity because we are able to be flexible at the beginning. Right. And um, so we realized that um, supporting and empowering women is completely multifaceted and it's a huge complex problem. Um, but we've just attempted to um, create our business so that we can actually at least cause a little bit of positive change. And um, one of the added bonuses, don't mean to cut you off, I forgot mm -hmm. to say this earlier, when you're working with organizations that are doing powerful things and when you're working with companies that are doing awesome things, you end up getting to work with awesome people. So I don't know if anybody else has had this experience, but part of working in a toxic work environment is you don't get to choose who you get to work with. <laughs> you get, don't get to choose who your clients are. But if you take the leap to be a freelancer or to own your own design businesses, you can really be specific with the type of people you work with. And a part of that, to, a way to do that is choosing the projects you work on, and then you end up meeting awesome people doing awesome things, and it doesn't feel like work. It becomes more of like a passion project which is such a cliche to thing, like, <laughs> thing to say, like, it doesn't feel like work. But when you're working on something like empowering women and trying to stop sexual assault on campus, it becomes more of like a drive and determination to do something bigger than yourself, which is really empowering for us, too. Right, great. Well, um, so I guess we're going to open up the floor if you guys have any questions, comments, experiences that you'd like to share. Um, we're happy to answer anything. You can also sit here for the next 15 minutes, too. <laughs> so somebody said that they own their own design agency. Was that you? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, um, I started a business with my business partner, the graphic artist, um, in 2009. I come from IT and, um, and programming development, um, high tech side of the, of the industry, and of course, male dominated. Oh yeah, always. Um, oh yeah. But I try to. I, I opened an iteration of, of the same kind of thing in Alaska when I was there for a little while. Very cool. So I came back down to California, found a graphic artist. I was like, you gotta start a business. And so we did, and it's grown to this, this amazing uh, 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 company called the Hybrid Creative, which is out of San Francisco. Awesome. Which is north of San Francisco. That's awesome. um, great. Was purchased by oh, a awesome. company. Congratulations, that's amazing. Yeah, so I'm no, I'm, the, the strange thing is I'm no longer a business owner. I don't uh, yeah. have a business anymore, but I have a, you know, I've, uh, I've sold it to a larger kind of company. And nice. that was ridiculously amazing. Um, we built the team to like, win 19 now. We started with this being a business partner in 2009 for you know, the other perspective houses. And then built our team. We're going to probably expand to 30 or so in 2019. That's amazing. Great. Uh, Inspiration. Right? right. <laughs> and it's, it's hearing stories like this, too, that like also just like feed us. You Yay. know, it gets us going, gets us exciting. And I think it's important to share those stories. So that's kind of why we're asking, too. It's if you're thinking about starting a business, like, there's people in this room who have done it. Yeah. Connect yeah. with those people. It is, as you know, it's crazy hard and difficult. And, you know, it's, it's sort of jumping into the unknown and starting risk taking. Yeah. But, you know, it's terrifying but exhilarating. It is. And Perseverance is so important. Sticking with it, you know, standing up for yourself is hard. It's yeah. Hard and yes. Hard and it's mm -hmm. It is, and it's hard when you're owning a business as well. You're still having to be in those rooms sometimes. You're still having to ask for the price that you want, or for ask for the package, and not get taken advantage of. And that's something that we didn't really speak a lot on. But you know, when we're working with sliding scale businesses, it's not that we're charging people less because they won't pay us less because they're trying to like manipulate us. I think we've gotten pretty good at navigating that and recognizing that and having flexibility in that, but that's still a huge learning curve. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still knowing when someone is not charging you, not because they can't afford it, but because they just don't feel like it. It is fair. Yeah. Yes. 
And as like now I'm, I'm I mean, I was an executive of the company before, but I was the owner and, and president. But now I'm the exact, I'm actually an executive of this new company. Yay! Awesome. I see people. Wow. And, uh, and, and national, it's national. And I'm one of, I'm like the only exec, female executive. And wow, it's exactly. A boys club. Yep. And I have to assert myself constantly. Um, you know, they were going to put my business partner's portrait and bio on the, on the uh, investor relations page. And I was like, nobody, like, why didn't I get asked? Take a portrait and give wow. it Wow. Wow. Like, oh, right. Right. You own it too. I mean, yeah. Oh, happy. <laughs> right. You know, I, I, I have to watch for those things. And I mm -hmm. like to my business partner. I'm like, dude, you've got to have my back. It's, you have to be, yeah, you have to be supportive, men, men that are in this presentation. They just want their job. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I obviously asserted myself, but it's hard. You know, I, I, was, I had to sit there and think about it for a while. Right. How am I going to write this email? Yes. Like, you know, I right. Her, I know how to boss. I sort of call the boss. and didn't take my phone call. So I was like, okay. <laughs> but I did it. You know, the power of a well crafted email is oh, yeah. also <laughs> super important. And it's, you know, it's, 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 we tend to, we're taught to downplay ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I am, I am a, I do this constantly. I kind of take it as my fault. I downplay it. And I'm working with my, myself and my other my colleagues all the time to take it table. Right. Before. Right. Mm -hmm. Stick so up for there's, yourself. There's a way of doing it without being bitchy and bossy. Right. You know, even though you're still going to be called bitchy, bitchy and, and bossy. bossy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's about, you know, yeah. And having women around you to support you in that is so vital. So mm -hmm. going to meetups, going to networking events with women, which I hate networking events, but some of them are really fun, especially if wine's involved. Yeah. Like, I was say, you can find you don't mind the ones with wine. Right. <laughs> Those make it so much better. So if you're throwing a networking event, have wine. Little things like that. <laughs> Just kidding. So I'm pushing my own agenda here now. <laughs> But yeah, and then there's and there's moments like that too when you're in the workplace, at least in my experience, where I question like, well, is it a big deal that my picture's not up there? Or should I even ask for that? Or am I being needy? Or is is that, no, maybe I'm just being overdramatic. Or maybe I'm just, it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my fault. But then you think about, you know, the men who are on the website or the men who have those things already that have never had to think about, should I ask for this? It just, it's theirs. It's mm -hmm. an assumption. And, and that kind of goes back to this um, when I was discussing how women don't apply to jobs that they don't feel 100% a requirement for. Also, all the stats that I have, I have research that I can, if you want to give me your email, I can send that to you. I didn't just make up those numbers. I just. Funny. I use the same stat all the yeah. time. I'm like, women, women yeah. will apply for a job if they. Yeah, Me, a hundred percent, and they're hired on proof versus right. potential. And then sixty percent, right? Same yeah. In, in most of the I honestly, as a woman, I th I feel like you know I had no idea. I didn't know that you could apply if you didn't meet everything. Yeah. But my, I mean, even even my yeah. husband who you know is fully supportive and a feminist all the way, but like he does things that I'm just like you can do that like you know he he goes to a, you know he'll go to a boss and just be like hey i want i want this and then the boss is like okay and i'm like that's insane i don't even know Bonkers. how you would do that and i think it's it goes back to the you know it's just a it's a cultural shift that we really need to work on like breeding and raising strong women who know how to ask for what they want and men who support that and so men who support that. Yeah. and we're on the same team like this is about women and empowering women but it's not just up to women to do that it's up for, to men for to be in the conversation as well and for men to stand up when their partner's picture isn't on the website or they see that they're getting more than their counterpart and and something that um I found so funny going back to that 100% thing when I had applied to that promotion at that job, which was building a product for women, and their mission was to empower women, which blows my mind that I had these problems there. Um, the CEO who told me that I didn't have the requirements for the job, so I didn't deserve to get paid for the job, even though I had been doing the job, his only experience before becoming a CEO was coming up with the idea, and he was 25 years old. So. He was, just, yeah. was he felt entitled to it. He didn't see and he didn't see that contradiction in that he didn't have any experience. He didn't have the requirements for the job he was in, but he felt entitled to that. But when somebody else asked for that, he couldn't fathom it. And I wasn't the only female in that company to have that problem with that person. Um, and I found that in multiple industries that that men just assume that they're entitled to things. And I don't want to make like all men suck because there's so many great feminist men out there and 
obviously, if you're in this room, I'm sure you are also one of them because <laughs> I don't think somebody who didn't care about these issues would be sitting in on this presentation. And I don't want to alienate men and be like, y'all, just, mm. but I want this to be a conversation and I want everyone to feel inclusive. So, um, and that's, that's what's really going to make these yeah. changes. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's what's the most important to us. <laughs> right. So, it's like, don't be an asshole to anyone. It's really not that hard. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Right, right. Absolutely. Right. So we're very person person centered um, with who we're working with. And so we kind of approach it in multiple ways by sitting down and listening with the client and really trying to pull out from them what they mean when they're saying things and how they want to experience their website. And also recognizing that this isn't their field too. So it's this, it's this fun balance of like, we want to get all of their input and really listen to what they're trying to say while also like nudging them in the right direction without being pushy. Um, but like it, an empathetic approach. So when we work on these websites, we look at the research for user design. We work with the user experience. Um, we, one, of our, one of our contractors specializes that. But then we also just try to be like rational about it. Like what makes the most sense to us? And if we were on the other end of that, if we were that person who is using these services, what would I want to experience? Um, and we also do branding. So another big part of our company is branding. So a lot of the websites that we're building are part of a full like rebranding design package. So we have the unique position where we're able to craft the brand and the website at the same time, which makes it so much easier because you start learning, they kind of feed each other. You're, as you're building the website, you're learning more about the brand and you're learning more about um, what it says as a company and, and it kind of helps come together in this really cool evolved way. But we're also in that unique mm -hmm. position where we also do branding. So I think when you're when it comes down to design, when it comes down to user experience, listen to your client, do the research, research the industry, and just be logical about it. Yeah. Which I know isn't everybody's isn't everybody's field. It's not their specialty. And if it's not your specialty, find someone whose specialty it is. And yeah. we didn't talk about that enough, but one of the things that we found to be so helpful in starting our own business is hiring other professionals, hiring professional women, realizing that accounting is not our strong suit, so we don't want to spend our time accounting. Hire people who know what they're doing for the things that you don't know how to do. Yeah. Um, and recognize that there are things that you don't know how yeah. to do. Really like facing the fact that like, I really don't, I don't know, I don't know anything about this, you know. Right. I really just, and I don't want to spend you know. my time learning. Um, and then when you're well, starting, yeah, I, I that sounds bad. We, no, like, we learn all the time, but like uh, learning yeah. accounting. I don't want to spend my time learning accounting when I can be learning more design stuff. More design, yeah. Um, and I briefly touched about sliding scale, but an, another way that we work with that, and especially when you're a small business that is just starting up, consider bartering. Consider trading, trading your services for their services. That's how we got our first accountant, who has been a fantastic referral service and who mm -hmm. has constantly like been sending us clients, and also like. It's tax free that way when you're trading services it just makes sense and then it feels more of a more of a relationship building as well mm -hmm. and, a, and a funnel for more more clients yeah okay. great take on more clients absolutely and yeah. i mean that's of course something that you know we're kind of addressing right now because we actually are starting to hire more people, hire more people and, and it's becoming a bigger organization which you know and then you have to really focus on the structure of the organization and stuff um, so when we started it was just me and Katie and we have all of the relationships with all the clients personally um, but what happens is you know probably one of the next thing we're going to start doing is adding account, account managers, managers and new designers and so then you have to create somehow the communication between all those parties so that that empathy and that um, uh, that relationship is still there and even hiring you're people adding you trust. trust hiring yeah. people you hiring trust. people you trust awesome I mean you know hiring awesome women that you know <laughs> who also have the same values I mean it's just like you know finding people who have the same values so that you can you know you trust what they do and you, you know that they're going to treat the client the same way that you would 
And that um, goes when you're working on your business brand and your own business mission and vision, having that as your foundation as well. Mm -hmm. um, so then when you are building out the processes and the structures for taking on a new client or um, how you react, relate with a client, you have it systematized so one person can do it the same way with their spin on it than another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's definitely hard, especially because we want to, I mean, that's the fun part of the job too, is having those relationships and being able to let go. Like we are just now letting go and being like, you can start this one. Like, this is all you. We're like, ah. It's like sending your kids to school. Yeah, I don't yeah. have kids, but I assume that's what it feels like. <laughs> like you A got this. Bit. You're going to be okay, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Is there awesome. any other questions or anything? Well, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, and thank we you really so much appreciate for it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks.